Welcome to our webinar. We're going to be talking to you about our work, learning how uh, about how community resource referral platforms work for social service organizations. And this is work that's been happening in Trenton, New Jersey, through a project that has been a collaboration between Trenton Health Team and the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network at the University of California, San Francisco. Next slide. Before we get much further, I want to remind you guys, yes, we are recording, and yes, we're going to send you the slides and the recording after the webinar. Um, the Q&A is there for any questions that you have during the webinar. Feel free to ask them at any point, um, and you can comment on each other's questions and upvote other people's questions in case you see a question in there you really want to have answered. Uh, the chat is there just for any tech issues, so you can only communicate with the hosts and panelists there. So just use that for um, tech issues. Again, use the Q&A for questions. And again, the recording slides and any resources that we mentioned will be sent to you after the webinar. Next slide. As we're getting started, we would love to find out who is in our virtual room. And so we have two poll questions for you about your level, your stage of, um, of engagement with community resource referral platforms, and then um, specifically which platform you might be working with if you are working with one. So if we can launch the poll, great. So folks can just answer uh, these two questions, that would be great. And I think everybody can kind of see the responses as folks are filling it in. This is great to see. And again, for folks who are just joining us, welcome. We're filling out a poll uh, to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and, and, uh, and uh, experience with platforms. Great. Okay, I think we've got a good number of folks that have filled it out. And it looks like folks, I'm the only one who can see the results. Okay, apologize for that. So I'll go ahead. Oh, is my sound still distorted? Okay, hold on a second. I did get something telling me that my, um, Yuri, if you want to jump in and let me see if I can fix my audio and just finish up the poll. Sure, sure. I'll help you too. Um... Okay, so let's take a look. Um, we're going to close the poll now and see what folks have responded. All right, so oh, we've got a really, um, like a plurality of folks who have actually been implementing their platform for over a year. So really um, interesting. I hope that this can become a space to, to share um, your experiences as well. It's where we have a super uh, interactive Q&A. Um, and, among those who are implementing a platform, um, it looks like um, Aunt Bertha or Find Help rather uh, and United slash NowPow are the front runners. But actually, uh, there's a smattering of folks using. Sorry, there's a lot of folks using a smattering of other platforms. Um, so this is really great to see see what's in the room. Thank you so much. Great. Is my sound any better? Not, not really. Ah, okay. Um, let's see if we end the poll, if that helps at all. Oh, that's weird. I think it's out. Maybe it's got something to do with the poll. Okay. Uh, how about now? Yes. Okay, so it sounds like maybe it was the poll doing that. All right, well, thanks so much for filling out our poll, folks. That's really helpful. And um, hopefully the material we share today is gonna be uh, interesting to all of you, regardless of what uh, stage you are at. Um, but please, any of you who have experience, uh, please contribute your experience as well. Uh, we want this to be kind of a learning um, that goes in all directions. Next slide. 
So we jumped right in without really introducing ourselves, but now we'll introduce ourselves briefly. So I'm Caroline Fichtenberg. I'm with SIREN, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network. SIREN is a research and dissemination center at the University of California, San Francisco. And our mission is really to improve health and health equity by advancing high quality research on healthcare sector strategies to improve social conditions. I'm joined today, next slide, by um, my colleague, Yuri Cartier, who you've already heard from, who's a senior research associate and who was um, a key part of this research study. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to our partners at Trenton Health Team, um, to Greg Paulson, who is the uh, CEO of Trenton Health Team to introduce uh, the THT team and more about THT and the project. All yours, Greg. Thanks, Caroline. It really has been such a pleasure to, to get to have this partnership over the last couple of years, and I also want to welcome everyone today. I'm joined today by my colleague, Coyle Rick Stevens, who's our Director of Population Health, and Jessica Burnett, who has been our uh, Population Health Program Manager, who's really also kind of been a, often referred to as the now POW Queen of Trenton, uh, as she's uh, stewarded this product and the implementation of, of this project and the implementation of, of now POW throughout. Uh, next slide, please. So Trenton Health Team is a community-based organization. We, our origins come from healthcare delivery. So we were originally conceived of and formed by the two hospital systems, the one federally qualified health center and the city's Department of Public Health here in Trenton. Uh, we've now grown to an organization of about 50 colleagues. Uh, we're one of four uh, state designation, designated regional health hubs in New Jersey, which is a designation that lives within the Department of Human Services where Medicaid lives that, that um, charges us with stewarding the outcomes of Medicaid beneficiaries who live in our region. But our work is really even beyond that. We look at the broader health and well-being of our community um, and look at both the clinical factors, but even more broadly, all of the community conditions and social factors that influence health outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit about Trenton for those who are not from our, or haven't been in the Trenton community. So we are the state capital of New Jersey, located kind of right in the middle of central New Jersey. Um, a population that has declined a bit over the last 15, 20 years. We're right around that 83, 85,000, a majority minority community. And certainly uh, the, uh, the outcomes of the long history of, of disinvestment in this community with a lot of families suffering from socioeconomic conditions and, and a poor access to the resources that they need. We certainly have a high chronic disease burden, as one might would expect for a community like this, but we don't want the story of Trenton to be just about the negative pieces and the deficiencies or deficits or, or need for resources. It's a very proud, very strong community, and we're really um, pleased to work with all our partners in community-based organizations, in residents, uh, in all of the resources and all the strength that does exist here in the Trenton community. A little more geography, we're located within Mercer County, which is a, a community of about 250, 300,000, right in the middle of central New Jersey. And if I stepped out of my office here and drove 15 minutes up the road, I would be in Princeton. Um, so, you know, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did the life expectancy analysis, and we see a, a gap of about 15 years uh, in life expectancy by driving 15 minutes up the road. Next slide, please. So we've been in the space of trying to help address the medically related social needs or broadly the community conditions that impact health and well-being for quite some time. And um, we wanted to, as we became aware of these platforms, create an opportunity for a technology-based social service solutions that would help our partners be more effective and be more efficient um, so that they could make referrals to meet the needs of all of their community members, all of their clients. Um, as a side note, we also operate the health information exchange that covers our region, so we're familiar with technology solutions. We convene a community advisory board that is the, the structure that helps all of these shared organizations work toward our shared mission. Um, so it became a natural thing for us to think about how might we do this, um, provide this particular service to help our community. And we wanna create a space where the referrals are able to be measured and tracked in addition to being accessible so that we can look at outcomes and we can know how we're doing. We wanna know if we're having the impact that we all hope to have. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about our story and our journey that got us up to starting this project. Um, Back in 2016, we actually started in this space in partnership with the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute when they had some funding to launch 
the first social service referral directory that we used in this community in at Bertha. So we worked with the Quality Institute and at Bertha for some time to launch a directory here in Trenton for a bunch of reasons, decided that that was probably more effective at the county level. So the implementation moved from Trenton Health Team as the implementation partner to Mercer County um, and kind of worked through some of the early phases of how that might work here. At the same time, uh, one of our sister organizations was starting to talk with NowPow. Uh, so we had our first uh, demonstration of NowPow in 2017. And ultimately in 2018, um, decided as a community after looking at it together to implement NowPow in Trenton. Uh, that launched in January of 2019, uh, and we built a network of partners, largely through partners we were already working with in real life in person, um, with 26 uh, organizations joined by the end of 2019. Important to note, we as the Regional Health Hub have paid for this platform. We, we uh, licensed the platform from NowPow and provided support through our staff, largely through Jessica, to provide this to our community. So the access to the NowPow platform in our community was subsidized by THT and of no cost to our partners uh, for, for more than two years. And then got to uh, embark on this project with support from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in early 2020. And we really wanted the focus to be on the community-based organization perspective, right? There's been a lot of work in this space of healthcare saying, gosh, I need a way to address social determinants of health. I'm gonna refer out to CBOs and all these needs are gonna get met. And we really said, well, what do the CBOs think about this? What do organizations like ours think about getting these referrals from these platforms? What works for them? And how can we look at that side of the equation? Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, um, my colleague Jessica has really been leading this work, both the NowPow work and this project. So Jessica, I'd love to hand it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so after about a year of implementing NowPow, um, we noticed that we weren't seeing the type of uptake that we had anticipated. Um, so in 2020, we decided to um, seek funding through Aligning Systems for Health, an initiative of the Georgia Health Policy Center supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Next slide. And the objective of the research project was to identify barriers Trenton community-based organizations faced in fully implementing NowPow and to identify strategies to address those barriers. The second objective was to design and test some strategies to encourage more use, expand participation to optimize the use of community resources and to improve cross-sector care coordination for Trenton residents. Next slide. So the project was executed in three phases. The first phase included interviews with Trenton community organizations to understand the barriers they experienced in using NowPow. We also interviewed external communities across the country with demonstrated success of implementing tools like NowPow. In phase two, we developed and refined potential strategies from our phase one interviews and designed phase three. In phase three, we formally tested engagement strategies, conducted interviews with participants that engaged with the strategy, and then analyzed our quantitative and qualitative data um, and participated in many dissemination opportunities um, since then. Next slide. So phase one consisted of semi-structured interviews with 16 Triton organizations. They represented 16 leaders or managers and 12 frontline staff. The organizations also varied in their degree in use of NowPow and also represented among the 16 Trenton organizations were some that had declined to participate in our NowPow network. Um, we complemented our Trenton interviews with non-external community interviews. To name a few, we interviewed individuals at 211 San Diego, 211 Chicago, and the Lynn County Health Department in Iowa. And finally, we interviewed individuals from two different vendors. Um, and interviews were recorded, analyzed for key themes related to barriers to use and potential engagement strategies. Next slide. So from the interviews, there were four main findings. First, there was low perceived value of the tool. Interviewees expressed their comfort with their pre-established communication channels and referral making methods, whether that be a fax, an email, a phone call, or personally escorting a client or directly delivering an item. Many said their current workflows were good enough and also contained a human element or this warm handoff. Um, the second um, finding was that 
The community resource directory was perceived valuable by all of our interviewees. However, electronic referrals, not so much. And then third, even the organizations who expressed a need and also value in the tool, they still faced organizational barriers that, that prevented regular use of the tool. And then finally, to our surprise, trend interviewees reacted negatively to monetary um, incentives, um, which was a question we asked during interviews about different strategies. So some said they felt they were already compensated or you know, being paid for assessing need and making referrals. And they felt uncomfortable with this idea of receiving a financial incentive. So they offered non-monetary um, strategies, which we considered as we designed the strategies. Um, next slide. All right, so in phase two, we synthesized our strategies from our phase one interviews and presented them to our now PAL steering committee, which is a group of trait and care providers and our project advisory committee, um, which is an, a group of experts working in the cross-sector alignment space from both healthcare and the CBO perspectives. Um, and we further defined and, um, I'm sorry, we further developed and refined our strategies um, from this. In designing the strategies, um, we faced a few constraints that impacted strategy design and implementations. Uh, for starters, we originally anticipated high interest in the use of financial strategies to understand how they might impact use and address CBO barriers um, to using the tool, but our community organizations were not interested. Um, and so instead we considered monetary incentives. Second, we could not mandate the use of the tool. And although we saw success in this approach with the THT program that we will discuss later, we could not mandate, mandate other organizations to use the tool. Um, and thirdly, THT teams uh, supported the implementation of each strategy. So we had to consider workload of our teams and the sustainability of strategies, especially if a strategy was successful, we would want to continue to offer that to our community. And finally, time was a constraint. This is a project with a beginning date and an end date. Next slide. Okay, so in the end, there were seven strategies that we considered. And because of the constraints I mentioned before, we could not test them all. So we conducted a survey to identify the top four strategies most appealing to our community organizations and feasible for THD to implement. And the top four strategies were a referral hub, a communications campaign, monthly data insights report, and tailored training. Now I'll pass it over to Yuri. All right, thanks, Jess. Um, so here were the four strategies. We decided to go with the um, top four. Uh, first, implementing um, monthly data insights reports, uh, referral hub with a smaller group of organizations, a more tailored, a revamped um, and more tailored training and onboarding process. And then finally, a communications campaign. I'm gonna be going into each of these to share what we planned, what we hoped or expected would be the outcomes and impact of each strategy, and then the reality of implementing and um, and, and seeing the results. Um, so the first was uh, the monthly data insights report. And we imagine that by receiving a monthly email with accessible visualizations of their platform use metrics and comparisons between the organization's use with the entire network, we thought that organizations would be prompted to remember, first of all, now POW exists, it's there and available and log in, um, feel a little community FOMO, be like, oh, I'm using it this much, the network is easy, it's, it's up and at it and uh, activated. Um, we thought they would send staff to, to get trained, feeling prompted uh, to action, and then uh, internally encourage their staff to use it more. Um, and on the right side, you can just see an example of what one of the um, figures from the data insights report looked like. So what happened? Um, we did uh, send these reports to 10 organizations. Um, so for there were four different monthly reports that were sent to each of these organizations. There was a pretty, you know, I would say moderate um, open rate, uh, but we did see that open rate taper down 
for the last one. When we interviewed um, organizations that had participated in this strategy, uh, we found that they were, you know, moderately aware, um, but they told us, you know, I know my organization doesn't use NowPow, and I didn't really see the point in looking at a report that confirmed what I already knew. Um, and while they did feel a little bit of the of the FOMO, the fear of missing out, but it wasn't. It was more a little bit of a regret. Um, it was well, I I you know seeing these metrics, I felt badly that we're not using it, but we're just not using it. It didn't prompt um, more use. Uh, however, for one interviewee, it did uh, prompt them to. Um, to consider what how they could reach out to their staff um, and engage them to use the tool more. Passing on to the referral hub. Um, so the idea of the referral hub was having an on-call social needs screening and navigation team that was staffed by THT um, that was accessible by sending a single NowPow referral. So instead of making referrals, one referral per need for someone with multiple needs, there's just the one um, referral that goes to THD and they would handle the navigation and referral process. We thought that this would prompt organizations to, um, to anticipate how the service could save their staff time. Or you know, if they have um, a client that has needs that aren't met by their organization, uh, would give them the opportunity to make uh, send someone to get those needs met. Um, and that consequently that they would log in and send referrals to the hub. Um, when we were implementing this um, strategy, we were very keenly aware of the workflow, sorry, of the workload um, risk to the THT team. And so we restricted um, this strategy uh, to three organizations. Ultimately, only two of those who were invited were able to implement. Um, and then um, we experienced many challenges uh, with the implementation, with some turnover in one of the organizations. Um, and then there was a, a problem with timing around the new school year. Um, despite that, we launched the hub, um, but unfortunately no referrals were successfully sent through the hub. Uh, one CBO um, sent a couple referrals to a different THT team um, that was listed in the directory. And the second CBO actually thought that the referral hub and the electronic referral functionality that's already in NowPow was the same thing and was sending tracked referrals through the platform. Um, so since there was no adoption, uh, there was you no know, impact on, on the use, but um, that second organization that I mentioned, um, it was a sort of, oh, okay, it's it's really easy to send electronic referrals through this platform. Um, and so there, there was a positive impact there, even though it wasn't the one that we were seeking. Um, the third uh, tailored training and workflow planning, we anticipated um, that, by implementing this planned um, leadership uh, value conversation to get buy-in, do workflow planning, having a more interactive training, and then doing more follow-up post-training. Um, we anticipated that organizations would be prompted to buy in more deeply at every level of the organization on what the value of NowPow could be for them and their expected benefits, to have uh, more clear use cases and workflows to be able to use NowPow right away after the training and then sustain use of NowPow in the months following the training. In the end, we um, encountered a lot of difficulty in being able to have the uh, work, the leadership uh, conversations and the workflow planning sessions. Um, and sorry, I missed a uh, bullet there. You know, in the end, the the actual reach of the um, the intervention was was also low. Um, however, we did train thirty six um, individuals, 
um, and data snapshots were sent to three of the five organizations. The other two actually didn't have any use following the training. So the, there was a follow-up email, but it didn't contain uh, any use metrics. Just an encouragement. <laughs> um, this, uh, the tailored training was highly appreciated, um, especially the, uh, the multiple touch points and the um, part of the training where, uh, where folks searched for the resources that their clients would actually need to really put, put the, the tool into practice. All right, and then I'm gonna go to the last, which was a communications campaign. So this actually had many components. There were monthly emails that included testimonials of peers using and finding value in the platform, um, which those testimonials were both videos and blogs. And then on top of that, we organized a convening at the leadership level and end user levels for the whole Trenton network. Um, and in doing so, we thought, Again, that folks would remember, oh, now pow, yes, it exists, it's available to me um, and log in. Um, in seeing the video testimonials, we thought they would connect their peers' positive experiences to what they could do with their own work. And then lastly, feel like, okay, this is a community effort, we're in this together, um, we're bought in and that would encourage use. And I, we have a screenshot here of, of one of the blogs. Um, so we sent uh, seven email campaigns um, and with three videos to over 400 individuals. And while you see pretty pretty solid open rates here, um, around a quarter to a third, the click rates were very low and very few people viewed the videos. Um, we did manage to um, convene 28 uh, and 41 participants respectively in the two convenings. And through those, we learned um, from first from the for the emails that you know, there was just there's email overload going on, and uh, folks did not really prioritize emails from NowPow if they knew again that they weren't using it. Um, however, in the convenings, um, you know, it confirmed what we'd heard in in the first year of our work around the community resource directory being highly valued. Um, but some additional learnings came up as well around um, the importance of confidentiality in electronic referrals and the importance of interoperability. I'm going to pass it over now to Caroline. Keep asking your questions in the chat. There's some great questions coming in. Okay, so um, I'm going to share a little bit about looking at the actual now how use data. Yuri kind of presented the highlights, but wanted to share some actual data. So this shows monthly logins uh, per organization from 2019 when the network was launched to last August. And each line represents a different group of organizations. Um, the line in um, in uh, blue, red, I should say, let me start with red, represents the organizations that were received the data insights reports. The lines in yellow are the organizations that participate in the referral hub. The lines in green is the uh, organizations that received the tailored training. Is my audio garbled again? Okay, I'm gonna turn my video off, see if that helps. Is this any better? Okay, I'm so sorry about this. Um, tell me if you want to take over, Yuri, or if you want me to keep going. Keep going? Okay, great. Okay, and then the rest of the network is the line in blue. And so a few things to notice. First, overall, looking at the numbers, you can see that um, numbers of logins are really pretty low per month. As you can see, we're having them, like many of them are less than five many months. Um, so we're getting, um, in general, over the whole course of this, the number of logins per month per organization have been pretty low. Um, the other thing is, um, looking here, uh, the lower right, 
This shows when the different strategies were tested. So in red is when the monthly data insight reports went out, which was from basically mid-June to, um, to early October. We have the referral hub trainings that happened uh, or launch that happened also in the early fall and the tailored training in the fall into early um, 2022. Um, and comparing those um, red and yellow and green lines to the blue line, we did not really detect any um, significant changes um, that could be associated with the actual um, delivery of the interventions. And the same with the communications campaign. Now you will see that like there are some peaks happening in this period here, but if you go to the next slide, um, what we realized is that much of what was happening here was really not related to the strategies that we were testing. Um, um, the, you know, we had a peak here in November, October, November, December of 2020, and then some other peaks later on in 2021. And it turns out that those were directly related to a produce prescription program that required use of NowPow to access the produce, uh, the produce boxes. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's what Jess alluded with the idea of the impact of requiring use of the platform. Um, and then here uh, we saw a couple other peaks that were also related to other uses of the platform. Here, for example, there's a huge increase amongst one of the organizations that was part of the data insights group, but totally unrelated to the data insights work. Um, and so it, 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 I have to say that, that we, um, we were disappointed that our strategies didn't work, but we did learn through this that some other things do seem to drive impact. And I'm gonna turn this now over to Jess to share a little bit about those things. Um, I think I just kind of summarized that. So yeah, let's go to the next slide. All right, there I go. All right, perfect. So thank you, Caroline. So. In the graphs presented by Caroline earlier, um, there were the pronounced spikes in the NowPal logins. And those spikes, again, they represent logins due to require use of NowPal to make referrals to a specific program. And for this THT produce prescription program, the, the program manager made a decision early on to only accept referrals um, for their program through NowPal. And as a result, more care providers re re uh, request access to the tool so that they could make referrals to send their patients to receive this free produce. And then also the team continued with this workflow for five cohorts, as you saw in the graph, because it was so helpful in managing referrals more easily. Now, this was not a planned strategy for our project, but it just shows that if you do require it, people may, may use it if they're interested in the program. Next slide. Here's a, a, another um, example. So as, as THT tried to get others to use the tool, um, and while we were conducting this project, uh, THT staff and um, the Trenton Food Stakeholders Group um, developed a, a tool for a specific use because of some limitations with NowPal. Um, this food finder was created from a need for more tailored filters and for real-time updates. Um, and then together the stakeholders identify their needs and their gaps. Um, and they, um, they had shared ownership of the tool and it increased in sophistication over time. Next slide. One more example of, of stakeholders coming together and identifying needs. This is um, a screenshot of the baby item inventory database, um, again, developed by THT staff and the Trenton Maternal Stakeholders Group looking for a solution to a problem. Um, and they did consider NowPow, but again, there were some limitations in the functionality. They were looking for a more practical way to monitor specific items within the community as they were being donated to different organizations. And they wanted to track that. They also wanted to share information among one another, this very specific stakeholders group about these items. And they also wanted more control over the listings. Um, this database is not live yet, it's, it's in progress. Uh, 
All right. I think it's Caroline. great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for bearing with us for our back and forth. Okay. So overall, what did we learn from this work? Uh, Yuri, go ahead and. So one thing was there's definitely a strong interest in Trenton in the resource directory. Everybody we talked to um, and when we did the community convening said, you know, resource directory is super helpful. But there was really very little interest in track referrals. There were a few organizations that were in interested in it, but for the most part, as Jess mentioned, people had other systems that they had already developed that they used um, and they really liked um, using those systems. Next. Um, and there were lots of barriers to use of track referrals. If you wanna just click on all of those, yeah. So people had existing referral processes. Some organizations had already had existing mandated tracking tools. So for example, HIMS in the housing world, there was a lack of comfort with e-referrals or with technology. So for smaller organizations that had staff that you know, were not super tech comfortable, you know, this felt like a really big lift to use this, this tool that felt kind of complicated, et cetera. Um, there were some people who did use it and then they, they found, um, you know, there were some frustrations with the limitations of the platform, for example, kind of the way in which it was just in a county and didn't extend beyond the county. So that could be challenging. Um, and then just overall a lack of time to figure out how to use it and, and, um, and fit it into people's workflows. Next. Um, the other thing that was really striking is that whenever we had conversations with people, they would be excited about the idea. Um, and I think Jess can attest to this too, that when they would do trainings, there would be excitement about the idea, but then there would be very little use. And when we talk about use, you know, we're talking about, about logins, but also particularly about the track referrals, um, which were very, very low. Um, what we did find is that there were some organizations and individuals for whom this the track referrals felt really great. And these were for organizations that made a lot of referrals and also who had staff who were really new to the community. So one example was a person who was totally new to the community and came to a, um, once a week to a uh, food um, giveaway at a, at a church and helped people connect to resources. She didn't know anything about the resources in the community. And so for her having this ability to directly refer to resources and find out what would happen. That was great. She didn't have the existing referrals, you know, relationships. She couldn't call people. This was a super great tool for her. But for people who had been doing this work for years in the community, you know, they would rather just call the person that they know at the organization rather than go through this other kind of system. And I think we have two more points. Um, so the strategies we tested didn't work, but we did see that there were things that could drive use of NowPow. So things like the produce referral program. Um, and then finally, you know, despite having access to NowPow, THT and trying to promote it, THT itself for some very specific needs decided to go ahead and create its own like separate tools from scratch for specific uses. And so there's this tension I think that we're seeing between having a tool that's really well adapted to a specific use um, versus a tool that can be used across a lot of different uses, but that may not be really that good for any one of those uses. Okay, I know we're running low on time, so pass it to, back to Jess. Sure. So some things that that might work um, just from, you know, facilitating trainings, working with our community partners um, and implementing this project and also thinking about some of um, the projects that I mentioned earlier that that were um, specifically the produce project and then the maternity, the maternal um, food find, not food finder, the food finder and the baby uh, item inventory database. Um, we think it makes sense to gather community uh, together to assess the need to design solutions together and then to decide if technology is the solution, right? There may be something else that needs to happen. And maybe it's gathering together and figuring out how to better communicate and coordinate. Maybe it's not technology. And then we also recommend assessing an organization's readiness. And um, 
from our research project, we do have this readiness worksheet that we will share with you all afterwards about some questions that we recommend organizations ask themselves before moving forward with um, adopting these technologies into their communities' workflows. Um, just some things we've learned just from implementing um, over the last almost three years. Um, we also recommend, or we think what might work is going slowly and piloting very specific use cases. And we provided three examples earlier. And then finally share those successes um, with the community to, to build interest. Next slide. And then, <laughs> or mandate the use and provide funding um, to cover the costs associated with the use of this tool. Um, and so we have, you know, one, one example, and there are some others that have kind of uh, popped up after kind of the close of this project where folks are implementing and kind of mandating the use of now power for a specific referral pathway. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, we see these sort of two potential avenues. Um, for the future, um, but we wanted to um, end, um, you know, this presentation with a step back and asking ourselves some questions um, around, you know, the bigger picture. Um, Walter Lloyd's um, in a seminal 1999 paper on the integration of um, medical and social care posits, you know, one of the, the five laws of integration that your integration might be my fragmentation. That is to say that efforts that go across sectors, that is that that are an integration effort are actually um, a fragmented approach for from the vantage point of, of one of those actors. So for example, in our first year interviews, we encountered um, organizations that were using four or five different tools depending on the funded grant program and had all of these uh, reporting requirements, you know, and, and so they're like, well, I guess you could mandate another tool on top of that, but they are already working in a very fragmented way. So keeping that in mind as we proceed with these integration efforts. Um, second, you know, the, the two um, THT homegrown tools, raised the question for us around um, how the specificity of homegrown tools really helps meet needs. And, and we're wondering, oh, could this mean that homegrown solutions might work better in those spe specific use cases or um, as well for the benefit of being fully bought in by the community stakeholders? Um, and lastly, you know, this work has really hammered home for us that the technology is not the network, that the, the, the technology cannot substitute or um, be, serve as the network. The network is the people and the relationships and the trust, and the technology can be infrastructure to support that, but it should not supplant those relationships. So with that, we want to thank you all for listening and apologize for how long we've run, but we still have 15 minutes um, for Q&A. If you have any questions um, about this and want to reach out to us, um, you can reach out to Siren or um, THT. The email addresses are here. And um, as Jessica mentioned earlier, um, we do have a readiness and self-assessment worksheet that THT developed that we'll send along with the recording and the slides from this um, webinar. Um, and on the left here, we actually have a brief detailing our findings from the first year of the project that are um, available in um, on the Trenton Health team website. So we'll put the link to that in the chat. I'm going to stop my sharing and we'll move into Q&A. Yeah, thank you all for a wonderful presentation. Um, we, and thank you, um, attendees, for your many questions. Um, so due to time constraints, we may not get to them all, 
um, but um, we will provide answers to all, the, all of your questions in one form or another. So I'll start with one. Um, given that Aunt Bertha is still being used regionally and there are other information systems presumably being used by 211, HMIS, et cetera, can you speak to the challenges and opportunities of establishing interoperability among systems? Should organizations be able to choose what information systems they use without closing themselves off from coordination with other organizations using other information systems? I'm happy to take a stab at that, Coyle, if it's helpful. I mean, so yeah. as mentioned in the beginning, we engaged in this work already operating the health information exchange platform, right? So the concept of health record interoperability is very core to who we are and what we do. This question, I think, raises the issue of that multiple platforms question. So is the solution a single platform or is it interoperability amongst platforms or, you know, some combination thereof? One of the things we did is make sure that our, our NowPow instance is actually connected to our HIE. So all the documents created through this process are put back in the HIE record and accessible to clinical providers. But that really doesn't solve the other issue. Um, you know, Caroline, I saw you, you go come back on video because I think this is a question that Sirens looked at a lot nationally on that interoperability question. And I know you're still doing a lot of work there. It seemed like too big a question for us where we're still figuring out how would these tools really work? What are the components of the directory that are most useful? You heard about a couple of tools that our teams designed out of an organic understanding of need, not because they came into the place to design a tool. So I feel like there are some other questions that we'd have to answer before we could meaningfully look at would interoperability amongst these tools even be an option? But did you want to add to that, Carolyn? You good? Okay. Great. Thank you, Greg. Next question. Can you expand more on the financial incentive that was used, proposed to encourage CBO participation? Was it a one-time or an ongoing per referral? Jess, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I'll try. I'm, I'm, it's been like two years. I'm trying to remember how we, I remember it was definitely a question that we asked during our interviews about, you know, what might encourage more use? And then I believe we asked the question like, you know, if you could think of any financial incentive or some type of strategy that required some type of reimbursement, um, we asked it that way. Um, so it really wasn't that defined. Like we were, we were hoping to get suggestions from our interviewees and then design some type of strategy with that. So we were really leaving it up to the community to throw ideas at us for us to consider what was feasible. I remember, okay. You're, I, I was you're... just add to that, that, um, you know, just showed really quickly the results of a survey um, where we asked people to rank different strategies. And one of those strategies was another ranking strategy. So that sounds, okay, thanks. Uh, so frustrating. Um, so one of those strategies was a financial strategy that uh, we talked about grant Fund, whether people wanted to be funded to learn how to use the tool and people ranked that dead last. And they also, it was a strategy around like wanting to receive grants um, for providing services through the tool. And that was also not in the top four. Um, so we kind of tried different versions um, as well. I think we had something like 60 or 80,000 in our original budget for the project that was going to be intended to be used for those types of incentives. So we really thought it was something we wanted to test. Um, and we heard a pretty clear answer that people weren't interested in it. Great. Thank you all. Next question. How do we promote enforce accountability in using closed loop referral systems when agencies wish to stay within their homegrown system silo? Any thoughts? I mean, I think that this brings up kind of uh, one of the central questions here, you know, that we're faced with after doing this project. Can you guys hear me okay if my video's off? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and um, and I think, um, you know, I, I think what we're seeing across the country is everybody trying to do this in different ways. And we're still in this process of like trying to put together like, oh, it seems to be working okay here, but not that great over here. What we learned in Trenton is, in a relatively kind of, you know, relatively small community, right? 
um, where, you know, CBOs don't see a lot of value for having uh, a new tool that facilitates track referrals. If it's not integrated, I think if it had been integrated with their existing tools, if it had been something that linked up existing tools, I think it might have been a totally different ballgame. Um, or if we had focused specifically on a few um, programs where people really wanted to, to be able to send referrals to each other. So we saw that with the produce referral like that. People used it. And then Jess mentioned that there's a few other things happening now where people are starting to say like, okay, well, maybe we should use NowPow for this particular use. So for example, there's some substance use and mental health referrals that are being, that are very active right now on NowPow. Um, but I think, you know, I think the central chat, I mean, the key, key things that, you know, I've taken away from this is, you know, start with the need and the people and then figure out what kind of technology can be helpful for that. But the technology is an is a is a support for what it is you want to do, not like the solution. Um, and then um, the other piece is that integration. You know, like we can't expect people to use five different tools that aren't talking to each other. And I think that when this project started, you know, the field of these technologies was early enough that a lot of those integrations hadn't been worked out. My sense is that that's starting to happen much more. Um, so for example, we're doing a project in Oregon where um, I think that they're um, with, and Unite Us is the platform there and that they're gonna be um, implementing some kind of direct integration with EMRs and hopefully other data systems as well. Uh, but I think it's really important not for this, not just to be integration with EMRs, right? It has to be with the data systems that social service organizations are using as well. Um, so that's just kind of, I don't know if that's quite answering the question, but um, but I, um, yeah. Anyway, okay. someone else on the team want to add anything to that? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Next question. Can you describe how you assess applicability of referrals? For instance, if the referral was open when the client was able to go, or relevant to their needs or satisfaction with the service. Any assessment, thoughts, feedback here? This is our biggest struggle with these services, especially if there's internal feedback from CHWs or direct service providers that understand how certain CBOs may be more culturally congruent on socially relevant to certain clients, making not referrals, making not all referrals equal. I mean, I, I'm happy to jump in on that a little bit, Koyal. You know, I, I think we didn't get to the place where there were enough referrals coming through the NowPad platform that we were looking to evaluate them. I think the place we work in that space, and we didn't talk about it as much on this presentation, but we have a separate um, community care team that's made up currently of uh, nine community health worker positions overseen by registered nurse, social workers. So that's kind of our source of that wisdom of kind of what's working and what's not. Um, but we have not yet gotten to the place where we really felt like we had enough data coming through the referral platform to then match it with that on the ground wisdom that our community health workers have of what works and what doesn't. Uh, I think that's a really great opportunity to do. Um, and that's part of how we want to think about this work going forward is we want the right people to get connected to the right organizations and have the right awareness of the total set of services and not be limited by that. I happen to know of this particular person, therefore that organization gets most of my referrals. Um, but we don't quite have enough data yet to meaningfully be able to look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Next question. Were the CBOs engaged in the initial platform selection and design, for example, a community-based design process? If yes, what was their role? If not, do you think their lack of initial involvement affected their openness to using it? The 2016 rollout of Aunt Bertha was not, did not involve community organizations. That was a selection by the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute. When we made the decision ultimately to implement NowPow on top of kind of that existing Aunt Bertha in the county, um, that was a process that was really heavily 
um, discussed and made through our community advisory board network, which has about 100 organizations loosely part of it, um, you know, more than half of those more active. But we also have had kind of a subgroup of users. I mentioned in one of the written responses that that group has really been our now past steering committee, the ones who looked at the different social determinant screener questions. And, you know, we're still wrestling with the questions of true resident feedback and resident engagement. What does that really look like? Um, so we've stayed in the space of those who are involved in this work, whether doing it on a volunteer basis or, or part of their formal employment, um, but very heavily part of us all working together to try to, to try to make these decisions. So it was interesting. We mentioned to those executive leader or frontline staff sessions where we had the feedback. Everyone came into those. It was, oh, great to see you again. You know, kind of it's, it's that kind of very um, collaborative kind of collegial environment. Um, so this is all done where we all kind of know each other and are all participating in the decision as best we could at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I believe we have um, time for one more question. Um, so this is related to financial incentives again. Can you, can you clarify what you mean by re requiring use? Earlier, we heard that organizations objected to financial incentives. If those requirements were really about funding conditions, it sounds like they are actually negative financial incentives that you found to be efficient in driving engagement. Are there, are there concerns about the equitability of the strategy given the expressed concerns of CBOs? Yeah, I think that's a really, really great question. Um, and um, I think that, um, you know, this is why we said, like, if there's any kind of requirement of use, it has to be accompanied by substantial resources to support that use. I think that if we had said to CBOs, look, we're going to fund like half a person um, so that you, that person can be managing the tool and dealing with the double data entry that this may involve because of a lack of integration. Um, and then in addition, for all the services that you provide as a result of the referrals that come through NowPow, we're going to pay for that, those service provision. You know, I think that that's, a diff that's the kind of requirement that we were thinking about. Um, I think a, a, a requirement to use without resources is a is a recipe for a lot of frustration um, and and really negative impacts on already underfunded um, uh, social service organizations. So I don't know if that answers that question. Anybody on the THT team want to add anything to that? Great. Well, I know we're at time. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to try our best to answer. There were so many great questions. We're going to try our best to answer as many of those as we can um, and share that back with all of you who registered for the, um, for the webinar. And we'll also share the slides and the recording um, as well as kind of like um, a, a decision support tool that um, THT has developed to help um, with implementation of, um, of referral platforms. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, here at Siren, we're, we're going to be thinking about how can we convene to learn more about these platforms together, because I think there's a lot of knowledge among people on this call um, that would be great to hear from. Thank you all so much, and I hope everybody has a good rest of their day.